Hello and welcome to another video. I'm on the road today. Uh, a little bit of a different video today. I'm going to go and look at a wrecked M2 down uh, down in Sydney to, to see if there's value in it um, as I constantly are uh, getting requests for race parts. Uh, the M cars, the M2, M3, M4 and the F shape uh, one very sought after car at the moment and because they're just a great platform that you can literally throw a tune on and some downpipes and make you know 600 horsepower and they're very competitive when it comes to to driving them on the racetrack so i'm going to have a look at this i'm going to take you along for the ride and then i'm going to jump in uh later on this afternoon to the computer and talk a little bit about crypto i watched this podcast from anthony pompolino uh with Raul roll and uh I'm going to take a couple of snippets from that from that podcast and show you uh, what they're seeing or expecting the world to be to be doing in the next you know, six, 12, 18 months, based on the uh, potential death of, of the currency, uh, potential death of macro investing. And if you don't want to know what macro investing is, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a definition of that as well. So uh, just stay tuned. I'll, I'll literally assume that you know nothing. Uh, and that you're a student of the world and that you're wanting to to learn so uh, yeah stay tuned I'll, I'll, I'll jump in this uh, I'll jump into this yard and go have a look at this car and take you along for the ride and then we'll talk about crypto this afternoon here you Oh, he's got his wheat bix in here. He <laughs> must have been busy. There's a pack of wheat bix. Is it? <laughs> uh. It does start, I think. It does? Yeah. yeah. Very dusty. Where did it sit? It sat under in under cover in the um, assessing shed, but yeah. under a rack. Man. Okay, so I'm back at the office now and just took some time to go look at that car and see if there's some value on it. There's definitely some value on it depending on what it goes for at auction. So I will keep you guys updated as to what happens with that. If you are interested or you're finding that, you know, seeing the crypto side of what I do on a daily basis as well as the automotive uh, and other business that I have side of things, if you're liking this content, please let me know. It really helps because uh, I, I, I'm trying to be creative each day, thinking about ways to show you like behind the scenes what I end up doing on a daily basis. But at the same time, I find it interesting. <laughs> You might find it really boring or quite stupid. So give me give me some insights. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this video, I uh, watched this podcast uh, that Anthony Pompolino put on, and uh, with a multi multi millionaire uh, ex hedge fund manager, I worked for Goldman Sachs. We're all Paul, and uh, it's an hour and twenty minute long. Uh, podcast and it's something that I'm going to link below this video that I'd strongly strongly recommend you listen to and or watch as I'm going to do my best to summarize it uh, as well as take a snippet of about 20 minutes out of it the important parts uh, but getting it, hearing it from the horse's mouth I, I can't recommend it enough uh, but I also know that my viewers friends and clients do value the executive summary version which is essentially what I'm going to be going to be doing you. So one of the things that uh, is mentioned, Roel mentions in the video is that uh, in February when Biden is going to be appointed president, he's going to end up coming in mid when the virus is going to be going quite crazy again early next year. And the reason being is there's a lot of travel in the US and as he says uh, in Europe, uh, essentially the Christmas is going to be cancelled somewhat or to some extent and Christmas is essentially the Grinch that stole, uh, so Corona is the Grinch that stole Christmas is, is his words. So in, in America, they can't actually 
cancel Christmas, uh, as you saw with Thanksgiving. Uh, a lot of travel happened on Thanksgiving, but it's it's really commonplace in America for families to travel all over the place to see their, their friends and family during these uh, festive seasons, and the US government just can't stop that from happening. But the one thing that he does say is that the usual businesses, the small businesses uh, that are utilized during Christmas periods, like makeup artists, hairdressers, all of the different things you need to, or that different people use, are not gonna be used as widespread as they would normally be because of all the restrictions. So this is gonna cause a lot of uh, strain, financial strain on, on these small businesses that require that income to be able to provide for their family, uh, which is ultimately gonna put a, a big strain on the economy. Now, uh, after Christmas, there's gonna be all this travel, people aren't gonna be quarantining, people aren't gonna be social distancing, and there's potential for the virus to be going crazy again. And that's gonna potentially happen in February when, uh, when Biden is, is uh, handed essentially the keys for the United States White House. So uh, it's gonna be a very interesting time seeing that happen and, uh, and seeing what goes on there. So uh, he also mentions that Christmas is, is probably gonna be canceled in Europe because a lot of the restrictions are already there and are, are, are being really enforced uh, because a lot of the different countries just can't handle more lockdowns. So they're locking down early, which to me doesn't really make sense, but it also does at the same time. Uh, but what this ultimately means if there is lockdowns, which is happening in Europe, as well as other parts of the world, is the governments are gonna to need to stimulate. And this is where we kind of go into really deep dive with, with this, uh, this interview that um, Anthony Pompolino is doing and get to see from someone who's been around the financial markets since you know the 90s and made a lot of money uh, trading all of those years and in, in different types of uh, currency inst instruments, I should say different types of investment instruments on all different markets all over the world. So. Uh, he also talks about the death of macro investing. And if you don't know what macro investing is, uh, I'll jump on the screen right now and give you kind of a quick overview. Global macro strategy is a hedge fund or mutual fund strategy that bases its holdings primarily on the overall economic and political views of various countries or their macroeconomic principles. Holdings may include long and short positions in various equity, fixed income, currency, commodities, and futures markets. So for example, if a manager believes the United States is headed into a recession, he may short sell uh, stocks and futures contracts on a major US indices or the US dollar. He may also see a big opportunity for growth in Singapore, taking long positions in that country's assets. So how does global macro strategies work? Global macro funds build portfolios around predictions and projections of large-scale events on a countrywide, continental, and global scale, implementing opportunistic investment strategies to capitalize on macroeconomic and geopolitical trends. Global macro strategies may forecast and analyze trends involving factors such as interest rates, politics, uh, domestic and foreign policies, international trade, currency exchange rates, and other factors. Global macro funds are considered among the least restricted funds as they generally place any type of trade they can choose using almost any type of security. So in a nutshell, macro being dead is interest rates are going to zero. The political front globally is becoming more and more one world government. And a lot of the domestic and foreign policies are starting to merge together as one. There's constant economic trade, uh, international economic trade issues and as you will hear in the video coming up shortly, there's the potential for global currencies and the global currency market to be dead eventually. So this is why the macro investing strategy is not really one that would be focused. It's still be, gonna be used, but it's not gonna be something that's focused on by new and upcoming traders. Also, another thing that is mentioned in this snippet is the Brenton Woods situation. Uh, if you don't know what the Brenton Woods situation is, I'll also give you a summary of that right now. So what is Brenton Woods? The Brenton Woods system of monetary management establishes the rules of commercial and financial relations among the United States, Canada, and Western European countries, Australia and Japan after 1944 Bent Brenton Woods Agreement. The Brenton Woods system was the first example of a fully negotiated monetary order intended to govern monetary relations among independent states. Uh, the chief features 
of the Brenton Woods system were an obligation for each country to adopt a monetary policy that maintains its external exchange rates within 1% by tying its currency to gold and the ability of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to bridge temporary imbalances of payments. Also, there was a need to address the lack of cooperation among other countries to prevent competitive devaluation of currencies as, as well. Preparing to rebuild the international monetary system while World War II was still raging, 730 delegates from 44 allied nations gathered at the Mount Washington Hotel in Brenton Woods, New Hampshire, United States, for the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference, also known as the Brenton Woods Conference. The delegates deliberated during the 1st to the 22nd of July 1944 and signed the Brenton Woods Agreement on the final day, setting up the system of rules, institutions and procedures to regulate the international monetary system. These accords established the IMF and the International Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD, which today is part of the World Bank Group. The United States, which controlled two-thirds of the world's gold, insisted that the Brenton Woods system rest on both gold and the US dollar, and Soviet representatives attended the conference but later declined to ratify the final agreements, charging that institutions that they had created were branches of Wall Street, and these organizations became operational in 1945 after a sufficient number of countries had rallied the agreement. On the 15th of August 1971, the United States unilaterally terminated convertibility of the US dollar to gold, effectively bringing the Brenton Woods system to an end and rendering the dollar a fiat currency. At the same time, many fixed currencies such as the pound sterling also became free floating. So in a nutshell, it was a private closed door banking event where they chose globally how monetary policy would be rolled out as well as how credit would be distributed globally and it was all tied to the gold standard. Now, in 1971, this was converted from the gold standard by Nixon to the fiat currency standard, which allowed for printing of money or the unlimited amount of printing of money. So that's the print of wood system. Okay, so that kind of gets you up to speed, gives you an understanding of what macro investing is. It also gives you an understanding of Brenton Woods. Now, we'll jump into this uh, 20 or so minute snippet from this podcast. Buckle up, because you are about to get a very, very healthy dose of international investing, as well as a bit of education around hedge funds and, and how money markets work worldwide. You recently had this thread that uh, went viral around the death of macro, right? And, and uh, what it seems like is that intervention overlaid with all sorts of long-term trends that are now kind of all meeting or intersecting has led to this conclusion. But maybe let's just start with like, what do you mean when you say there's the death of macro? So... As a macro investor, what do you trade? What do we do? We look at economic signals and look for dislocations in markets where we can profit from those economic trends or dislocations. And that means generally trading top-down asset classes as opposed to picking stocks like Microsoft or whatever it is. So we're looking at currencies and bonds, the two biggest and most liquid markets on earth, commodities because they tend to work according to the economic cycle. Things like precious metals, they work according to the monetary cycle, and equities, which are the least macro because they're all based on human behavior um, generally. So, and credit markets is the other one. So, okay, that's the rule book. So whether you're Stan Druckenmiller, George Soros, any macro legend, how have you actually made your money? On the Real Vision interview with Stan Druckenmiller, he made it very clear, he says, everyone thinks it's all about stocks and all of that stuff. He goes, I made all my money in bonds. They all have. Right. I mean, I've been in this business since 1990 and bond yields have fallen ever since. And, you know, you've only had one serious pushback um, and they've actually been falling since 1982. So everybody's career, Stan Druckenmiller is included. There has been one trade. Why bonds? Well, because bonds actually give you high returns with very low volatility. So risk adjusted returns are amazing, which means you can take massive leverage. So when things like the economy slows down, bonds rally and bond yields fall. And that kind of 18 month period between the start of a recession afterwards is when you make enormous returns. They all do, they all have, that's macro for you. And bond yields are now at zero everywhere. And I think the US probably ends up with negative rates at the end of this too, much like the UK just went negative over the, over the, um, you know, uh, the autumn. So we're negative to zero interest rates. 
So basically, there's no juice left in that trade. So the biggest trade in the world is gone. Okay, credit. I'm not much of a credit guy because you need a bit more knowledge of the underlying you know, credits themselves. But if you're trading credit as an asset class, as many macro guys do, well, the Fed and the ECB just stopped that game, as did the BOJ. They basically said, we're not going to allow the credit markets to price risk because we can't. And the reason being is we have this old population and they've got all their money in pensions. If you wipe out the pensions, you wipe out the savings of the baby boom generation, which is the largest generation on earth. So that's not going to happen. So now you don't have a credit market and you've seen triple B credits are now all time low yields again <laughs> in the middle of an insolvency event. Brilliant. So no mechanism to price. The equity market basically took all the strain. So the equity market, people said, well, look, let's look at tech stocks that kind of look like, you know, um, perpetual bonds or zero coupon bonds because they generate cash, they've got no debt. So we can price those to infinity because where else do we put our money? I get it. Is that right or wrong? I don't know. The ma macro guys are all trying to figure it out, but they're very nervous of the equity market because nobody understands this new paradigm. Is it real or not? But then the big one is coming, and that's the death of the currency market. That's something that I've been talking about. If that goes, then macro is finished. Because currency, like bonds, is enormous, super liquid. You know, trades for three or four trillion a day. So it dwarfs anything else. Now, what we've heard from the IMF, the BIS, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, the ECB, the Fed, People's Bank of China, and everybody is this move to digital currencies. And I'm sure we'll get in a bit more about that in a bit. But what's been clear is the IMF are pushing for an agenda, which is the new Bretton Woods. And Bretton Woods was an agreement amongst nations basically to peg all their currencies to, the, to gold. And then famously, Nixon came off the gold standard eventually. But that was a post-World War II construct that allowed all nations to kind of not compete with each other on interest rates, to build a platform of which once they built Bretton Woods, they built everything from the United Nations to the World Bank to the IMF and all of these institutions that we know. So if the IMF is saying this, what are they saying? So I've gone through their speeches and they're basically saying, OK, we're in an extraordinary situation right now. Countries need to print money for, to fiscally stimulate, as we talked about earlier. But it's kind of difficult to do it. And if you fiscally stimulate to the amount that you actually need to, let's say, do proper stimulus, not just giving a check, but creating jobs by creating industries and all of those things that need to happen, well, that's like 20 or 30 or 40 percent of GDP they need to do. How do you do that without devaluing your currency? And the answer from the IMF is do it all together. If you do it together, then what are you devaluing against? Well, hard assets, Bitcoin, gold, stuff like that. But you're not devaluing each other. You're not winning terms of trade. This is the idea that Facebook Libra had, which is create a basket of currencies where the dollar is one of the currencies. It's not the denominator. So if you think of everything else, it's like euro against dollars, yen against dollars. What they're talking about is having the dollar in the basket. If you do that, then the denominator is money supply. So it becomes a very stable thing because money supply, yes, at times it goes a lot, but it doesn't grow that much. So then what you're basically doing is dampening currency volatility down to zero. And so in that world, um, let's say that we play this out and they actually successfully create you know, a basket of existing sovereign uh, or nation state backed fiat currencies. Uh, and there's kind of this quote unquote one world currency, right? H however you want to think about it. One, that kind of removes all competition between countries, right, in terms of interest rates and, and, and all of that. But two, how does that change what I'll call just the management of monetary policy at the individual country level? Is there still some level of sovereignty and, and each country can kind of do uh, certain things within parameters? Or does it almost get consolidated in um, you know, some sort of like global central bank type well, uh, situation? You know, don't forget... Bretton Woods was essentially a consolidation. But interest rates, countries still need to borrow and lend, and there, there is an interest rate market. So it's not what the ECB is doing, which is creating a single currency. What it is is creating a currency basket of which currencies move around and change their weights within it. So it's more like the S&P than it is the euro. So it, it is different. 
But I think it opens interesting dynamics of, okay, let's say they do this. Let's say to be a member nation of this bank core, which is what Keynes talked about back before Bretton Woods. He said, why don't you do this? It's basically the same idea, roughly. So to be a member, let's say, okay, all members are allowed to print 50% of GDP this year altogether. So everybody does their printing, everyone does their fiscal stimulus. After you do that, you're limited to 2% money supply growth. Or if not, you're out of the basket, so you get worse trade terms. Okay, well, that's interesting, because then you're actually turning it into something that has a limited money supply growth. It actually looks a bit more like Bitcoin. Obviously not in many ways, but in terms of supply. Now, will nations cheat? Will it all go wrong? Of course, you know, <laughs> they're central banks, of course. But, you know, there's interesting mechanisms that they can create out of this. And I think there was a tweet that Sahil Bloom put out today about the Overton window. This is an Overton window. Basically, anything is up for grabs, much like it was after the 1930s when all of these institutions were built and after World War II, too. Anything can happen right now. And this is fascinating. You know, this whole central bank digital currency thing, that's going to lead us into a whole new world. But the death of macro seems like it could be a reality. Now, obviously, that's slightly flippant because macro moves around into different areas. Now, in a world like that, what does it mean for emerging markets? It's probably exceptional because let's say you're South Africa. You get killed every time the dollar goes up and you can't export your goods and all of that sort of stuff. But if you have a stable currency to trade in, well, you're going to do much better. So it's probably incredibly positive for emerging markets. Okay, that's interesting. You know, what does it mean for commodity markets? Well, maybe they become less cyclical. Um, how, do, how do countries compete with each other? I don't know. It's probably technology. It's, you know, how do you attract capital in that world when it's not interest rates necessarily? You know, it becomes really interesting as a, as a thing. And, you know, and then how does obviously Bitcoin and gold and stuff like that fit into that? Really interesting. So macro could shift it. Maybe it doesn't. But there's a once in a lifetime, not even a lifetime, a once in a century opportunity to change the construct of the system. Now, whether it's any better or not, I think it'll be better, but it won't solve the problems. Fiat money is a bigger problem itself. For sure. And I think one of the most interesting things is uh, as this kind of death of macro trend uh, accelerates and, and becomes kind of more real, uh, what we're starting to see is many of the quote unquote legends of Wall Street who really are just macro traders who have done very well for themselves. Uh, one by one, they're raising their hand and, and um, you know, kind of revealing their interest, intrigue and positions in crypto in general. Right. Usually it's Bitcoin they start with. But but kind of you see everyone starting to uh, not just do it, but be public about that position, to uh, go on television and talk about that bullishness that they have behind the trade. Um, let's start with Bitcoin. I think last time we talked, you were uh, kind of single digit percentage uh, exposure to Bitcoin, and then you had kind of a, what I'll call quote unquote traditional uh, portfolio, but traditional for, for you versus others. Um, now you are 98% uh, of your liquid net worth is invested in uh, crypto. I think it's 80% Bitcoin, 20% Ethereum. Let's just start with like what changed or, or what were the things that went into you going from single digit percentages to uh, more than majority uh, in kind of almost all of your liquid, liquid net worth being so bullish on, uh, on Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum? And again, look, I'm a macro guy, so I don't expect anybody to follow me. You know, you do the same with your allocation. You're looking at it from a macro perspective. Other people can't take the risks. But for me, I looked at the situation. All outcomes for me were, now this is, it rarely happens. Let's say I'm right. Deflation is persistent. The economy is worse than expected. We don't get rid of this whole economic mess until let's say Q3 next year. Okay, so the answer to deflation and slow economy is, printing of money and more fiscal stimulus. Okay, let's then push that aside and say, no, Raoul's a total idiot, he's completely wrong, the markets are right, inflation is everything. In an inflationary market, well, Bitcoin and gold do well. So here we've got a smile where the least likely outcome, which is everything just returns back to kind of 1.5%, 2% GDP growth, and we all forget it's just happened. That's not gonna happen, simply not gonna happen Maybe it does, but that's the risk that we all run in the Bitcoin position. So basically, inflation, deflation of any sort, if we look at 
all the past episodes, whether it was 2008, 2012 in Europe, when Europe went, almost went under, and then periodically afterwards, the central bank kept stimulating, didn't stop. They're not going to stop here. So that, to me, is a good setup. OK, so I've now got a good case. So then the case is OK. At that point, I said, right, gold, Bitcoin, those are my main bets. I own some bonds because I'm a deflationist, and I had some dollars because and some other trading positions. OK, fine. So then what changed is the charts. You know, we'd all been looking at it, that the chart of Bitcoin was this beautiful, beautiful wedge pattern, triangle pattern, and it broke. So, of course, I'm, I'm a macro guy. I can see an opportunity. I can see a great chart when I see one. I start saying, right, look, we've got to get, we've got to add to this. And, you know, I added obviously into the big sell-off as well because I saw this pattern emerging. So then it breaks. I start adding. Okay, so now I'm over 50%. And, what, and just real quick, what were you selling initially to move capital? Was, was there a specific re- asset or were you just going across all assets and kind of taking percentage? I was just percentage? reducing trading positions because I okay. just saw that this one had the propensity to make more money than anything else. But then it got to the point where you start looking at the charts. And I started digging into the charts and writing about it in Global Macro Investor, looking at the comparisons of Bitcoin versus all other assets. And I started tweeting about this. And this is before it really started happening. I'm like, look at these charts. Bitcoin is about to eat the world, right? It looks like it's going to become the super black hole of which it's going to outperform every single asset class on earth. I've never seen this before. Literally, I've never seen it. You know, we've seen gold might be dominant, but you might have bought copper instead, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing, nothing, not even most of the Amazon and stuff like that. looks like it's going to outperform Bitcoin. So that's when I start saying, okay, this is the time to really go for it because it's a waste of capital to put it into anything else. Now, I'm not coming at this with the philosophy, you know, the Bitcoinization of the world or anything else. I'm coming at here as a macro guy saying, I've never seen a more dominant opportunity in my entire lifetime. And if that is the case, it's time to really back your bet. Absolutely. And, and so I think it's a good opportunity. One of the things that uh, I really enjoy when I talk to you is uh, you talk to lots of different people, right? So you talk to people in the Bitcoin and crypto world. You talk to people in kind of the traditional investing world. Uh, you, many of your friends are some of the best macro investors in the world, some of the most famous investors. Uh, and then you've got a lot of conversations that go on in the institutional world. I think most people know what's going on in the Bitcoin and crypto world and the traditional investing world. In the private conversations you're having with whether it's friends in the macro world or in the institutional world, what is being said in those conversations? And and I don't necessarily want to know from who, but just what's kind of the behind the door conversation around the macro environment and Bitcoin uh, specifically and kind of how people are viewing this? So the macro environment, you rightly alluded before, almost everybody I know has a personal allocation to Bitcoin. Now, Dan Moorhead was first to understand that this was going to beat all other assets. And then it sucked in, you know, one after the other. Um, probably John Burbank was probably next. And then, you know, Novo. And it just starts, you know, taking people in. People so, in, in raw, raw, people don't understand that you guys are all friends, right? They, they don't understand that there's an entire, uh, I'll call it generation of macro investors that basically grew up together and uh, kind of, you know, went through their careers. And somehow it went from, you know, one trade to the next trade to the next trade. And when Bitcoin became an opportunity, literally it just walked down this entire kind of loose collection of friends until everyone had exposure. Yes. I mean, so if you think of the, the, the macro network, it's not that many people, right? So it's basically the epicenter was probably a few firms plus Goldman. And then, you know, out of that, a bunch of traders at JP Morgan and a bunch of others came out of that. But really, it was Tiger, Soros, Tudor, More Capital, Caxton, um, Omega Partners, and a few others were the big macro players. Um, and those alumni are everywhere. So Dan Moorhead is ex-Tiger. Um, I think he was ex-Goldman as well. Uh, Dan Tapiero was ex-almost all of those. Um, you know, I was ex-Goldman, and then I was running a large hedge fund. So I was a salesman at Goldman, so I knew everybody. So I've been in the middle of the whole lot. So we all know each other. And if we don't know each other directly, we know of each other, because it's not a big universe of people. But it had tremendous influence and huge amounts of capital. Mm-hmm. 
Um, you know, and it was a very exciting industry because back in the day, these firms could have 15%, 20% volatility and had huge bets. So you get to hear famous people like, well, famous in our world, Nick Roditi, who was actually the big swinging dick at Soros. Um, he lived above a store in Hampstead High Street in London, completely below the radar screen. Um, but he was the most aggressive risk taker I've ever seen in the industry. Even Stan Druckermiller says, you know, I think Nick killed Stan on returns, but his volatility was enormous. The size of the risk this older, very quiet guy would take was astonishing. So anyway, so that macro world had high risk taking and high returns. In came the pension funds, in came the insurance companies, in came the sovereign wealth funds. And they said, well, we don't want you to be so risky. And they're like, yeah, but you're not going to get the returns. They're like, well, we don't really care. Um, so they crushed volatility down to 5%. Comes the rise of millenn Millennium and all of these big platform plays where they have lots of traders, low volatility, much lower returns. You know, 10% is a great year. And so what happens is these macro guys start either turning into family offices, Lewis Bacon from More Capital, George Soros was first, um, Julian Robertson, I mean, they all did. Because they're like, fuck that. You know, I want to make money the old fashioned way, which is not by having assets, it's by taking bets. These guys are the great speculators. And then some of those guys went, this Bitcoin thing's interesting. Now, most didn't get it in the beginning, they saw it as a trade. And then everybody saw it, started to see it. Oh my God, there's a parallel universe coming and it's all going to generate alpha because there's no capital and not enough knowledge in the space because everybody in it was a technologist and none of these macro guys were in it yet. So the macro guys went, here's an opportunity for us. And one by one, they all started going, have you seen this? You know, uh, you know if you ask Mark Yusko, if you ask Dan Tapiero, um, they will say that they really got into this at a global macro investor round table of mine. I think it was either in Cayman or in Spain, where one of the other global macro guys, another ex-Goldman hedge fund guy, says, by the way, I started a, a, a crypto, a Bitcoin exchange, and you need to find out about Bitcoin. This was 2012. And we started learning about it from them, and that network then spreads, starts talking about it. So we all kind of got polluted at the same time by similar people, it's just, it is a network. And that pollution is, you know, so cut to, I get a phone call on Sunday, uh, one of the, again, I can't mention him, it's one of the most famous hedge fund guys in the world um, and one of the greatest traders I've ever seen. And he really made his money in money markets. He's a rates trader, right? He's a world with no interest rates. So, you know, and I've been bugging him about this. I mean, he's been in crypto for a long time, he, he knows it. But I was bugging him, like, there's only one trade that matters. And the conversation on Sunday is, yeah, there's only one trade that matters. So, so as you can see, there's a lot of content covered in that. A lot of things that are very far outside of my scope. I do understand, but I can't really reiterate that well, uh, as well as they have done. That's why I put this snippet in there. Uh, if you're not already following the Anthony Pompolino podcast, please click the link below and definitely go give him a follow. And or watch the entire interview if you've got to spare an hour and 20 minutes. The other couple of things that are... Uh, the role talks about is that Bitcoin is a once in a lifetime bet. And that's why he's, uh, he's put 98% or so of his liquid net worth on the line in this, uh, in this bet, which is Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think it's 80, 20 from memory. So 80% Bitcoin, 20% Ethereum, which is a huge bet. And for someone like him, who's seen markets like this before and seen, uh, emerging technologies like Bitcoin, he's making a calculated risk, but he's also, and it's mentioned in the in the podcast, he's also got some mechanisms that he will execute if he starts to see a reversal of this. Uh, he also mentioned, and I really, really liked it, that he's very open-minded and he likes to prove and disprove himself in, in the different... Uh, the different ideas that he has around investing in all different markets. And he likes to think of, or one of the quotes that I'll, I'll quote him saying is that if, if I'm against a closed mind, that I, I have an edge. Uh, it, whenever someone says, don't buy this or don't buy a Ripple, don't buy you know this shit coin, he goes and researches it himself. So he knows for sure why he doesn't want to invest in that. And I think that's a really important point 
to have. That's one thing that I've employed in myself as well as in my mindset. I like to prove stuff myself rather than just uh, listening to what the parrots have to say because everyone has an agenda and all the parrots are generally the ones that have the biggest agenda. And another point that he made in, in the interview was that uh, we are trading against the adoption curve. So I've talked about in previous videos that we're at you know, the 1.3 to 1.7 to maybe even 2.5% global mass adoption of Bitcoin. And as the adoption curve goes up and more people get interested in it, those people who are buying at higher price points are going to be buying the coins that I'm selling um, to take profit from. So in a euph euphoric market, as it starts to go up, the people that are buying at these euphoric levels need to be buying from someone who's selling because that's how markets are made. There's a buyer and there's a seller. So it's it's super important to, to remind yourself that we are actually trading the adoption curve. And because we're so early, we have the advantage and it's super important to understand uh, as, as it starts to move up and not just hold forever. Taking profits is taking profits. It's very, very wise to take profits always. And then finally, the last idea that, that he shared is uh, and by the way, Anthony Pompolino, I just got to take my hat off to you, man. You, um, if, if you are watching this, you are a, a great interviewer. A lot of really strong and uh, difficult questions were asked. And uh, yeah, I just take my hat off to you. You're, you're such an intellectual and uh, you really know your stuff. I really, really appreciated this, uh, this podcast. So uh, Anthony asked, what, what, is, what is your morning routine look like? What, what is it that you do when you wake up? Because when you wake up, the most important things that you focus on are generally what set your day moving in a certain direction. So um, Raul says that he first looks at the bond markets, uh, he then looks at bond, bond yields, if they're up or if they're down. And again, these are, these are indicators that he's looking at globally uh, on a macro level to figure out how the markets have moved overnight. He then goes to the commodity markets to see what sentiment is like, to see if there, there is lots of movement in or out of different commodities. Uh, then finally, he looks at the currency market, and which is including Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. And then he goes to Twitter, and then the news, and then he goes to a platform that he's created, which is called Real Vision. So super interesting. This is someone that has made multi, multi, multi millions of dollars, has been rubbing shoulders with uh, some of the world's best macro traders in the world, has worked for some of these massive investment firms like Goldman Sachs uh, and JP Morgan. Uh, all over the world. So it's super interesting to hear his side of things, hear his take and what it is that um, pumps him up in the, in the morning and what it is that, that makes him uh, decide what he wants to do or how he wants to take these trades. Uh, it's super interesting to be following him on Twitter. He's got a hashtag that ir irresponsibly long uh, which, which is basically implying that he's in this game, in the Bitcoin game for a long time and uh, he's put an irresponsible lot amount of money, uh, which is to the tune of 98% of his liquid wealth. He still has businesses and, and that sort of thing. So don't look at this as um, going and just selling everything you own and putting it all into Bitcoin. He still has businesses that are creating liquid uh, wealth for him on the daily basis. All of his liquid asset uh, up until that point uh, is what he's invested in Bitcoin. So. Um, it's been really fun making this video for you. If you enjoyed my views and uh, summary of, of this podcast, feel free to leave me, me a like, um, leave me a comment below, and as always, um, share the videos. If you, if you feel you've got value from this and you think other people will, please please do share it around. Uh, if you haven't already jumped onto the crypto.com app, super easy, click the link down below. You get 25 bucks, I get 25 bucks. It's an easy way to get started with crypto. And then finally, sign up for the webinar, the Keys to Freedom webinar, where I, 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 te I teach you and share with you uh, my latest tricks and tips in the cryptocurrency markets, as well as give you some really cool, uh, high probability of, uh, of growing up coins that I'm speculating on. The completely free of charge, you're able to, to get those. So uh, that's it from me. Thanks again, and I will see you tomorrow.